Welcome to the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast, powered by the Precision Metal Forming Association. I am so proud to be here with you today. I, of course, am your host, Dean Phillips, and I have the distinct pleasure to have with me today, from the Franklin Partnership, Omar Nashashibi. He was the founding partner there, and uh, Omar, tell us a little bit about your big takeaway for the next five years. Well, my big takeaway is certainly going to be driven by the election results coming up on November 5th. We're going to be heading in one direction. If it's Donald Trump part two, we might be heading in a drastically different if it's Joe Biden part two. Then you layer on the uncertainty coming from the Capitol. We have both the House and the Senate up fully for grabs. Those could also switch hands. We are coming around the corner and dealing with the uncertainty of a fiscal cliff when it comes to taxes and end of 2025. And we can get more details on that, but there's four point some odd trillion dollars at stake in tax increases that are coming at the end of December of 2025. And that's one of the big takeaways that I'm watching, the uncertainty that might lead to less investment that also could create some opportunities if a tax bill is done right, if and when it does get done. Yeah. If you had to pick out of all the things that are going on this year, what are some of the ones that you see as being the most impactful? Well, certainly on the regulatory side, right now we are looking at the Biden administration that is making plans for the event that they do lose the election come in November, and that in January we have a second Trump administration that would certainly seek to unravel many of the regulatory successes, as they would call it, that the Biden administration has been able to move forward. We've got a key date coming up here in Washington on May 22nd, June 1st, somewhere in that range is what the lawyers predict. For the Congressional Review Act, that's a measure by which Congress can go back and reverse regulations that the Biden administration puts in place if Trump's sworn into office next January. And by that measure, the Biden administration's rushing right now to move through on regulations. And that's one of the biggest impactful areas that I see right now. We had just on April 23rd, the Department of Labor released its new overtime regulation that's going to significantly increase the number of Americans eligible for overtime subject to time and a half. And that is likely going to be somewhere around over three and a half million people that are going to be eligible for time and a half for full time salaried employees. And just on July 1st of this year, the Department of Labor's new rule is going to take effect and going to increase the current threshold for those that are currently exempt from 35,568 to 43,888. By next January 1st, 2025, it's gonna jump all the way up to 58,656. So for those that are now gonna be eligible for a time and a half, that creates a lot of different headaches for the HR department, for scheduling, for folks in operations, and especially if you're hiring. And you have to recognize the new rule also requires that it increase this rate every three years starting in 2027. So by the end of the decade, you might be looking at an overtime exemption threshold that's up to $70,000 annually salaried for executive administrative professional employees. And so that's just one example of one of those even just big ticket items for the rest of this year. The regulatory environment is going to continue to go on hyperdrive here as the Biden administration continues to ramp up and prepare for the elections. Uh, I, I seen something not too long ago. Can you tell us a little bit about what you see on the uh, OSHA side of things? Absolutely. And I just got a notice on Friday of this past week here that the NACOSH, the National Advisory Commission on, uh, excuse me, Committee on Occupational Safety and Health is going to have a meeting coming up, I believe, on May 7th. And that's where they will likely begin the process to accept recommendations to move forward on an indoor heat rule and also on outdoor. They were considering and put out a, some policy recommendations in September and October of 2023, where they proposed to put forward an indoor and outdoor heat rule when the heat index reaches and exceeds 80 degrees Fahrenheit. For example, they would want shift changes, maybe changing the times that you start. You could start from work at 5 to 2 a.m., work overnight to adjust and account for the heat. They want to potentially mandate 10-minute uh, break times every two hours if the heat index exceeds 85, or excuse me, 80. If it exceeds 87 degrees, then they look at doing a 15-minute break every two hours, mandating also the type of water temperature and the amount that's available as well. One, actually, recommendation they included over at OSHA on this indoor heat rule would have required water at each workstation and 
PMA, I do work for the die casting industry that has molten metal on site and having a droplet of water can cause a significant implosion of the entire facility. And, and that's one of those things that we went back to OSHA last year and said, a one size fits all recommendation is just not going to be workable here. And that's one that we are now, we're good heading into the month of May. We do expect to see some action coming out of OSHA, possibly as they move forward on a proposed rule. And at the same time, that we've got an increase on OSHA inspections, and particularly the new rule that takes effect at the end of May that allows third-party non-employees to a company and OSHA inspector. Even if you're not a unionized shop, they can bring in representative of labor. Even if you don't have this attorney on retainer, they can bring in a trial lawyer. They can bring in environmental activists. They can bring in a community organizer under this new rule called the worker walk around third party rule that OSHA just finalized in the last month. So there's already significant changes that we're seeing here. And you're right, OSHA is a big part. And we keep telling folks, whether you like it or not, the federal government is in your not so silent partner when it comes to running your shop. They are in almost every aspect of it and understanding what opportunities may exist, but also understanding the compliance requirements ahead of time will really help save those shops a lot of headache and money as it comes forward. Yeah, Doug Elke has been uh, a tremendous resource for the PMA over the years, and he's been able to help us with a lot of those things to kind of maneuver the waters of what we can and can't do, but also to understand what are what are our our rights as, as somebody who is visited by OSHA. What are some of the things that we need to look out for? And you know, he, he sometimes will joke about you know but when they come and you say. No, you can't come in. Well, <laughs> yeah, and you—that's the thing—is to that to that point, you do need to be speaking to the Doug Elkies of the world and him in particular, because when you do have these folks showing up with a third party, at least the advice that I've received from other councils is asked to see that individual named in the warrant to come onto the property, and if not, then obviously you've got to. First call is call Doug and then move forward from there. But there's a lot of entering into the gray areas, especially if there's lawsuits that are expected around the country that I know some of my clients are involved with that might seek to put a halt to this third party OSHA worker walk around rule. But you're absolutely right. Giving access to some of these folks to your facility, especially without them having signed NDAs, putting their phone with cameras away. A number of issues could go wrong in these scenarios here that's created by this new rule that is literally just days old, let alone weeks old. Right. And and you 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 hit on something right there talking about NDAs and talking about use of cameras and things like that. You know, it's it's different when you have somebody come in and you have a a, a working relationship with there's no guarantees that this person's using, you know, probably their personal cell phone and taking pictures and what kind of cybersecurity aspects are you addressing? You know, because Absolutely. now, yeah, and it's competitive data too. So if somebody else gets a hold of it and says, well, it's matter of public record, uh, that can also create a whole new set of situations there if, if we don't have those kinds of uh, rights protected. Yeah, that's right. And and there's more that can go wrong that can go right in these scenarios. And to be honest, when we went through this rule back in 2015 under the Obama era, we had OSHA folks say that they didn't like it because these inspectors do not actually want somebody looking over their shoulder, particularly the way this rule is drafted, because they don't necessarily have to have industry expertise in this field or even related. Whereas in the past, you're almost certainly going to have an industrial hygienist or somebody of that qualification that's going to accompany the OSHA inspector. And so there's there's a lot of detractors to this rule, and we'll see how it plays out in, in the courts. But to your point, there's a lot there. And even to mention the Federal Trade Commission just came out also on April 23rd with their final rule on barring non-disclosure agreements and non-competes and non-solicitation agreements in some instances as well. It's focused on non-competes, but it does also affect NDAs and certainly affects some non-solicitations in some areas. And, and that rule is certainly going to be challenged, will be tied up in the courts, will pass the election. But it shows, again, that changing environment that employers need to be constantly aware of. And, and that's where their associations are really important and, and listening to, to organizations such as this and podcasts such as this. And that's how you get your news. If you're running a shop day to day, you don't have time to be watching what OSHA is doing and trying to meet the deadlines of May, May 22nd and June 1st so they can rush with the regulatory agenda. Yeah, and, and that's why you know, the organizations like the Franklin Partnership are so tremendously helpful, especially from our standpoint, from the Precision Metal Forming Association of 
hey, what do we need to understand? Because there's, if you've ever seen a legal document that you see when they're putting these bills together, there are hundreds, if not thousands of pages of, of information, and you have to be able to maneuver that, those waters and people that are resources like yourself, like Doug Elke, uh, I know that we've had on here uh, before some of the other people like uh, like John and uh, uh, Paul Nathanson you know, to talk about what what is it that we we want to do and how do we get that message out to to people. Sometimes we we overlook things within the Precision Metal Forming Association. We think, well, our members are just our members, but no, we represent all of the manufacturing arena. So, you know, when we were we've been working for years on things like the tariffs. That doesn't just benefit our members. That benefits the entire organization, the entire world, uh, so to speak, too. So that, that's really absolutely right. It. And through the supply chains and all those areas, it, it really does. And when you speak to that, we go out and we talk about how manufacturing has an exponential factor throughout the economy in terms of not just the physical supply chains, but even just the services that are contracted and that are provided out there. For example, the Precision Metal Forming Association, to your point, represents a $137 billion metal forming industry in North America. It's got an over 900 member companies, but again, is speaking for that entire $137 billion industry that is also a critical supplier without which Department of Defense could not operate fully. The automotive industry certainly could not drive a single car or truck on a road. And the whether it's aerospace, medical device, electric electricals, you name it, recreation vehicles, urine stamping, metal forming is really at the center of it. Absolutely. So let's let's shift a little bit. Let's talk about what are you seeing with things like uh, foreign trade and uh, some of the challenges within uh, some of the some of the things going on with uh, how do we combat some of the things like dumping that we're still seeing and Absolutely. And when we look at this area, this is one of the few where both candidates, Trump and Biden, do have some semblance of agreement. In many cases, we've seen the Biden administration simply continue the previous administration's old policies on trade. We still have products coming in from China, 6,800 of them are subject to a 25% tariff, another 3,200 of them have a 7.5% tariff on them, meaning 60% of all imports coming in from China are subject to some kind of a tariff at this point. And Biden has not lifted any of them, but we're hearing he's getting preparing to take some steps to increase the tariff rate on certain products and potentially add some new ones. He recently called on his U.S. trade representative to triple the rate of tariffs on imported steel and aluminum coming in from China, for example. That's obviously certainly a play for the steel union workers, and Biden made multiple trips to Pennsylvania in, in April to that effect. And as we look forward to where we go on next steps with trade, foreign, whether regardless if it's Trump or Biden, we do expect for the next several years to have another round of tariffs continue. Biden has said that he will continue his policies of being, as he says, tough on China where, where it needed to be, but taking a more global approach and bringing other allies, including the European Union. The Europeans have told the Biden administration that if they are reelected, they will work with them on a carbon-based tariff for steel and aluminum. They abandoned those talks back in November and December after they couldn't come to an agreement on what they call the Global Arrangement for Sustainable Steel and Aluminum. That would seek to impose some type of a carbon-based tariff on imported steel and aluminum products entering the EU or the U.S. from countries that don't have a similar trading system. The U.S. currently does not have a way to measure its carbon footprint, but the U.S. International Trade Commission, it's an independent federal agency, is currently in the process of conducting a study with a report due next January. And that report will have an outline of what are the scope one, two emissions, in some cases scope three emissions for the steel and aluminum industry and a few other related products. And that's going to be the measuring point and the benchmark that the U.S. could potentially use to impose a carbon-based tariff on imported steel and aluminum in partnership with the Europeans. And the Europeans are watching this very closely. If, they're, if they believe that Trump comes in and if he does in fact win, next year, then they are getting prepared for potentially a 10% tariff rate, as Trump has said he wants to put on allies, or 60% on certain vehicles, or 100% on Chinese vehicles coming in from Mexico. So the divergence in, in tariff policy 
won't be so much will they or won't they apply tariffs it will be why will they do it on which basis will they it'll be under the national security if it's biden using climate change for carbon based it'll continue to be under the 301 action on china and national security on steel and aluminum for trump so we don't believe that we're going to see a lifting of tariffs for the next four years regardless of who it is maybe in certain products if it's biden consumer facing but industrial goods for the most part we expect to continue seeing some kind of a tariff system on imports coming in, even from allies. Right. Uh, and it is it is very different today than it's been in past years where it is an election year. And it is a year where we're, we're challenged to figure out where maneuvering these waters as we, we look forward in, over this year. And people are cautious. What What kind of comments can you make to the what what people should be looking at and what's important to us you know in our day-to-day -day lives but even in our investments and in our companies that we're looking at how do we make sure that we're doing the right things as we move forward you really have a convergence of factors right now that are coming in you have the elections but also you have looming deadlines that are coming up with the tax cuts and jobs act of 2017 that was a Republican passed bill signed by former President Trump that provided a number of favorable tax breaks. It took the C corporate rate down from 35% to 21%. It provided a pass through deductions under Section 199A that for you pass throughs, which more than half of PMA members are, for example, paying at the individual rate, it took that rate down from 39.6 to around 29%. That disappears, that 199A. So the C corps might still keep their rate on January 1 of 2026. But all you pass throughs are now going right up through the roof. You also have bonus depreciation, which now has fallen from 100% down to 60, falls down to 40% on January 1 of 2025, and then to 20% of January of 26. You see a number of different provisions, including the estate tax, a number of different favorable investment provisions that go to manufacturers all disappearing. And if you're an OEM, you're a large corporation, and now you're looking at potential Biden administration part two, the president wants to increase the C corporate rate from 21% to 28%. I believe if he is reelected, you'll see some increase and it likely will be to 25%. Regardless, that's more taxes for our customers who are PMA, PMA to be paying more. And that means fewer resources for them to be investing in many cases. And similarly, we look at some of the other provisions that are out there on the pass-throughs. It's unlikely that under a Biden administration, you would have such a favorable position as you had under the Trump administration for those pass-through businesses paying at the individual rate. You are potentially looking at tax increases then. These are uncertainties. And when you're having a Trump administration, it was not easy negotiating the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act with a president that was somewhat erratic, frankly, at times in terms of where he was on certain issues, whether it was capital gains or some of the other expensing provisions. And that created some challenges in terms of getting that bill over the finish line. We have to factor in who's going to be in control of Capitol Hill because we do know Republicans want to pay for part of this tax bill, and that usually means cutting some programs that are out there, and also could mean some changes in fees and structures and some actual tax increases. And that uncertainty heading in on the taxes, and this is a hard deadline. This is one of those where if Congress literally does nothing, then on January 1 of 2026, trillions of dollars worth of tax increases take effect. So this isn't about Congress or Washington taking action to inflict uncertainty on businesses. This is expected inaction. And what we've seen in the last year already from Congress is they're not gonna get this thing done on time. Many of us predict it'll be into January or February of 2026 after provisions have expired that a deal likely even comes together. And so what does that do if you're pricing, if you're quoting, if you're looking at your certain market segments that have that kind of lead time that are gonna be looking at uncertainty? And that's just on the taxes. Again, we just talked about tariffs. If it's Trump and he's gonna increase taxes or in tariffs on imports coming in, then what does that do to some supply chains? Does it create some opportunities for some members? And does it create some disruption for some others? Those are what's heading into even additional uncertainty than you normally had, say, between a Obama and a Romney, or even a Gore and a uh, Gore and a Bush going back that far. You could still kind of predict where some of them would end up, but you've got these hard deadlines and significant policy directions that have to be decided, all in the near future that will be decided by the listeners of this podcast, assuming they all vote. 
Right. <laughs> let's let's assume everybody is. <laughs> we'll, we'll go. Well, with I that. just gave you it much a stake. Just even <laughs> in the last few minutes, that's even to the average company. That's six, seven figures. Each company each year annually, if not more, in terms of the added tax liability that we just talked about. So there's a lot at stake. November fifth. I know they say that every four years. But certainly because of these deadlines coming up, there's decisions that are going to have to be made for, again, inaction that's going to lead to significant consequences. Absolutely. Final thoughts, Omar. Final thoughts is don't ignore the government because you hate politics. There are ways to understand how you can take advantage of how this administration and the previous one have incentivized manufacturing in America. The past eight years have done nothing else but drastically change the direction of the industrial policy that this country's had going back to the 70s, so the creation of EPA and OSHA, and even before that to World War II with the, the next Industrial Revolution. So I think that folks that can recognize that there are dollars to be had through the Department of energy for investments and for savings and efficiency that you're making already into your plans. Understanding that even under Inflation Reduction Act passed by Democrats, there are still opportunities to take those tax credits and invest in your shops. To also understand that on the workforce side, that there are ways to bring the money home from your state and local grants and tax incentives there as well. But also make sure to factor into your short-term, long-term plans, not just what the government has in store for you, but what the impact of those policy decisions could be on your customers. So you need to be thinking several levels ahead, as you certainly your customers are thinking downstream throughout their supply chains. Excellent. Omar, you are a phenomenal resource, and we really appreciate you from the Precision Metal Forming Association and myself personally. One of the biggest reasons anybody who's ever heard me talk has known that I have one of the things that I always mention is that one of the reasons I got involved with PMA years ago was because of advocacy, because they were our only voice. PMA is really our only voice we have in Washington and through the Franklin Partnership of people who are advocating for our industry, for manufacturing, for the metal forming, metal fabricating industry. So we really appreciate you. and Thank you for taking time to be here today. No, and thank you. And I appreciate you helping get that message out again. This is it's it's important work, frustrating work at times, but it, it, it's critical to the future of, of this industry manufacturing in America. Fantastic. Everybody go make it a great day.